Great. Good afternoon. Today is February 17th, 2017. My name is Kim Hewitt, and I'm here at the Wingate Residences at Boylston Place with Sam Starobin. Together, we're participating in the Newton Talks Oral History Project that is being conducted with the Newton Free Library, Historic Newton, and the Newton Senior Center. So, Sam, can you tell us about your connection to Newton? To Newton? Yes. Well, this is very marginal. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I, I think this is the first time I'm living in Newton. Before, I, li I lived in Bro Brookline, my neighbor. Okay. For a considerable number of years. When did you move to Newton? I guess when we entered here, which is yes, about three years ago. Three years ago, years ago. Brookline from my old news. What were you doing? Two and a half years ago. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Great. What were you doing before you entered the service, and what was life like for you before you entered the service? That's a good question. <laughs> I was not born in this country. I was born in Russia, and I came to this country in 1928, which is a time of depression. The depression had just started, so it was hard scrabble. And I moved to Milwaukee, where the majority of our large family on my mother's side lived. And let's see, when did I encounter the war? Well, I, when I finished high school, I had a problem of where to go to college. I couldn't afford the tuition, but I had I got a scholarship to the University of Chicago. So I was in, at the University of Chicago when the war broke out. I remember sitting there. I lived in a small student co-op that we ran ourselves, and sitting in the living room on a Sunday when the news of Pearl Harbor came, and we knew our lives would change, but we didn't know how. I went in and enlisted on the basis that I could continue college and until they needed me. Well, in April 1943, they needed me. And they sent me down to basic training at Camp Wallace in Texas. Texas, Texas was a favorite spot for setting up training camps because it had so many desolate spots that nobody else wanted. <laughs> Later on, they discovered oil there, but at, at that time, it was just a swamp. Why did you choose that specific branch, and what branch? Well, I enlisted in the Army. That's what you did. Not in the Navy, not in the Air Force. Matter of fact, there was no Air Force at that time. There was just an Army aircraft. So I enlisted in the Army. It was just the thing to do. What did you miss most about home besides family and friends? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> family and friends is it. So how did you adapt to military life, including like the physical regimen, barracks, uh, food, social life? It amazed me. I, I adapted immediately. I loved it. <laughs> I loved the regimen. I loved the marching. And I loved the unrecognized regimen of trying to get out of things. <laughs> Can you tell us more about that? Well, specifically, I remember one afternoon looking at the bulletin board, and it said that later that day there would be a 20 mile march at night. And next to, next to it was an announcement that as that afternoon there would be interviews for West Point. So, um, <laughs> they can't deny me the right to. So I went and was interviewed and forgot about it. 
life went on. And then one afternoon, a sergeant came to the barracks and said, starve and pack your bags, which was very unusual because at my pay rate, the lowest, <laughs> we didn't move separately. We were not recognized as individuals. We moved in packs. So I, so I asked him, where am I going? You're going to, um, let's yes. see, what is a college? No? Amherst. Oh, I'm sorry. You're going to Amherst College in Massachusetts. And what, is, what, 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 what am I going to do there? I'm going to, you're going to prep for West Point. As a matter of fact, just to give you a background, appointments to West Point are mainly political. Every congressman has some, every senator has some. I know congressmen, no senators. But the Army had a number of appointments, and 120 were available that year, or the next year. So they chose 360 to make sure that the candidates were able to pass the entrance exam. Generally, the Army people were not too well educated, so they put three times as many. But of the 360 young men who showed up, five out of six had been to college. So it wasn't, the academics were not particularly a problem. In any case, I showed up at Amherst, and uh, that was a fat year, taking high school level courses. And then came to the, the end of the year, took the exam, I passed, of course, and off to West Point. I remember we came in at the railroad station, we marched up the hill, and then our lives changed. We walked up as individuals, suddenly we became non-entities. Raw material to be molded and into a new form. And got to the top of the hill where they where we were met by West Point upperclassmen. Go you drop your drop your bag, pick up your bag, tuck your chin in. So my God, what's going on here? <laughs> but I quickly found that's the regiment for newcomers. That was the first day. The next day was a holiday, so we were allowed to relax. So, well, thank God that's over with. <laughs> I can't take much more of this. Well, it took much more a year. Yeah. So where exactly did you serve, and do you remember arriving and what it was like? Well, after graduating from West Point in 1947, we then went to two other training camps, and then I was assigned to the Far East, to Japan. I had just married, and I didn't want an early marriage to be interrupted by war. So I decided to go to the Far East, which seemed more trouble-free than Europe. Was I wrong? Yeah. I landed in Japan in 1948. In 1950, the Korean War broke out. And I was in Korea within a week. We were pushed back to a small perimeter around the one port of Busan. And then MacArthur showed his brilliance and did the end around. Korea is a peninsula. And we were crowded down into the southeast corner of it around the one port of Busan. He staged an end around halfway up the peninsula, and then an amazing thing happened. 
the enemy did not withdraw. They disappeared. Suddenly they were, one day they were there, the next day they were gone. So, we drove carefully, carelessly up to the northern capital, Young Dong Po. I remember being in Young Dong Po and in the big ceremonial buildings that they built there with the pictures of the dictator still on the wall. And now, as I say, Korea is a peninsula, but it has an attachment to the continent, and that attachment is very mountainous. Those mountains serve for electric generating plants. But the power did not go into South Korea, which was not industrializing. It went to Manchuria, which um, was industrialized by the... The communists had taken over China just a year before. This was 1950. They had conquered China in 1949. Therefore, they had an interest in those plants. So when we got up, when we invaded the country, the, the peninsula of Korea, and MacArthur did the end around, and we, we thought the war was over. Well, the war would have been over if MacArthur had not. had not exceeded the cut of one in Ikuchu. If we had stayed away from the attachment to the um, continent, that would have been the, the communists did not care about Korea. They cared about the hydroelectric plants. I remember I was an intelligence officer encountering a, a, a line Washer. He looked like a peasant, peasant dwelling, but he told me he was headed back to report to headquarters that the hills were, that the mountains there were full of Chinese troops. Well, so when MacArthur gets that news, maybe he'll slow down, maybe he'll not push it. He didn't. As a result, we went into those hills. The enemy kind of sat on the, on, on the mountains and watched us. And then one day they just came down and they cut off the troops that were headed up. We lost a regiment of troops. We didn't see them again until after the war. Later I found to my satisfaction, that MacArthur wanted a war with China. We had the bomb, they did not. I figured, guess he figured we would catch them at the birthing moment and kill them in the cradle. Didn't look that way. So, let's see, to wrap up this particular episode. We uh, we had awakened a sleeping giant. They didn't care about the the continent as long as we didn't hurt the, the uh, peninsula, as long as we didn't pose a threat to the to their regime. We had we had pre we had presented that threat. And so they decided to take all of Korea. They cut off our probing troops. We didn't see them again until after the war. And they pushed us down halfway to the hurdle, where we then fought the war for the next three years. Last year, something like that. Can you tell us about a few of your most memorable experiences, whether they were positive or negative? Uh, 
thought I was a company commander. We were holding the line in Korea. I was, my engineer company was in support of an infantry regiment. We were halfway down uh, on the peninsula. The enemy had not yet attacked us. The, the regimental <coughs> commander called me and he said, the enemy is breaking through on our left. We have to go and support them. You hold us down. Well, I immediately scrambled to find a place that was defensible. And while I was checking that out, the first motor shell hit, hit me about, hit about 10 feet away. I remember running around in a circle. It's like caught my bearings and then went up to the troops. We pulled out of that part. We pulled out of, we were ordered to pull out of the, that just in defense of it. And then on our way to join the rest of the regiment, which was about 10 miles away, we were caught in an ambush. I remember leaving my, leaving my troops in a jeep. And then the road, the roads there were very narrow. There were no, no getting off the roads were built up because the rest of the land was paddy land. And on the road was a truck. Couldn't get by it. Suddenly a man came up out of the swamp, out of the, the land, got in the truck and drove away. I should have been so savvy enough to recognize this was an ambush. I didn't. I was still green. So, he was out of the way. I continued maybe a hundred feet and machine gun opened up. Blew the tire out of my jeep. Didn't kill him. Didn't hurt him. And then the machine gunner got up and left. He was all by himself. In the meantime, it created a bit of chaos. So, the first encounter with the enemy. And after that, it settled down. We drove on. He joined the regiment. He came within the perimeter and we awaited the rest of the war. So, did you serve anywhere after Korea? Yes, I returned to the United States, had a, an assignment in Europe, and then returned to the Far East for the uh, Vietnamese War. Do you recall the day your service ended? When I left the Army? Well, that was... That's a rather complicated story. This was in 1968. In 1968, there was a presidential inaugural. And I was appointed to help plan the inaugural. It's a complicated process. And it didn't go well in that. So after the inaugural, they were just forming the, the government of the District of Columbia. The District of Columbia is a creature of Congress, and the type of government they have is set by Congress. Well, I, as an army officer, was assigned to help them deal with the inaugural. Evidently, did it well, because they then appointed me in a civilian office in the District of Columbia government. So here I was an army officer serving as in a civilian function. I took to that very well. I enjoyed it. But then they told me you got to choose because I was holding a, a, a high rank 
and the civilian government was waiting for me, but I was in the army. Well, there were contenders for that choice spot to choose, so I went and left the army, apart from the army, became a civilian, and went back to the same job for a few before. So, transition was easy. So what was it like when you returned to civilian life? You said it was easy, but did you find any issues? Well, I had left the security of the army, where everything is regulated to the Wild West form of government in the District of Columbia, where there were many contending, contending factions, and particularly many ambitious individuals. So, I had to learn to survive. So how did your service and experiences affect your life and your outlook on war and the military in general? Well, as I look back on that, my service, I realized that the war was really to no purpose. People were getting killed. We won a battle here, we lost one there. But it missed the point. And the point was that the people of Korea wanted to govern themselves. And our pre pretensions that we were protecting them for the serve. We'll destroy the country to protect it. And, and very specifically, the, um, we were, the army was engaged in a struggle with the North Korean army, the North Vietnamese army at this point. The Air Force wanted action, so the bombing. They didn't know they were bombing because the jungle growth was so dense that they, they didn't see what had happened. They wanted to they wanted to revel in their destruction. So they decided to deal with that obscuring growth. So they started spraying Agent Orange. Agent Orange is a neurologic agent. And uh, I was affected. I'm, I'm still affected by that Agent Orange. I have Parkinson's. But, but the idea that anything goes as long as we can do our mission, and we'll define what the mission is. Our mission is to bomb. We want to bomb. I'm suffering from that, but the people of Korea, the people of Vietnam, are suffering much, much more. They have left a devastation of it, of it, sickness. They, we have left a devastation. Do you want to finish your thought? Can you tell us about your time in Germany? Well, I went to Germany in what was it, 1956, I believe, as a regular assignment. I was assigned as an engineer officer to a infantry regiment. But I had been there only about six months when I was given a Totally new assignment that gave me a complete new career. This was a time of great tension with Russia. The question was not, are they going to attack? When are they going to attack? The French were part of the Western coalition, 
and bailed out de Gaulle and his, his ambitions, he not permit him to accept anyone as his superior. So he, they bailed out. So where do we get the troops? So he decided to start the new German army. I was assigned to that mission. So I worked with the Germans for two and a half years on that side, and then returned for another three years. What was that like for you? Well, when I was first appointed to that, I said, here I am, a Jewish boy, assigned to teaching the Germans how to fight. I don't need it. came back and said, you do what you're told. And so it started a very interesting career and a very interesting phase of my life. I got to know the Germans very well. I served in support of a division. I was assigned to work with the engineer battalion of that division, which is a very friendly association, and uh, I enjoyed it. Are there any other experiences you want to share with us today? Well, let's see. What would you like people to know a hundred years from now? That war is a futile enterprise. And it is hard to resist. It must be resisted. There are better ways of solving our problems. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to do this with us today. We're really happy to be able to include you in the Newton Talks Oral History Project. Thank you. Thank you. After formally finishing their interview, the participant shared another story, which will follow without introduction here. One of my most interesting experiences was to meet the man who had fought on the German side and had broken them, and had been, been one of the people to break the uh, national line. Mm. He led a, the national line was a series of underground fortifications. The only thing that popped up around our firing positions, toadstools and mushrooms. And, uh, the French had, had built such a line, and then the Belgians had extended that line. They figured that, that line would hold the Germans. It didn't. They broke through one day. And how did they do that? The, the entire line was underground, except for firing positions, and then behind the lines was a was a central control center that was also underground, but in the mushroom. The Germans sent a company of troops in by helicopter, by glider. They landed behind the lines, they broke into that, and the fortifications which just tended to hold the enemy forever, for, for hopefully, but for many days, well, immediately, they captured the control center and the line had to collapse. I met the man who, who commanded that German enterprise, very interesting man, and discussing it with him was a high, high point in my career. Do you remember his name? I'm 93 years old, <laughs> <laughs> and things like names are fading into the mist. Okay. Okay. 
Is there anything else you want to add while we're still going? Invaded behind the enemy lines, mm -hmm. and they disappeared. So um, we went down the road and like a Sunday picnic. We, my division ended up in the port city of uh, I the name, but it was on the west side of the Korean Peninsula. It was a seaport. There's only one trouble. It was mined. Mm -hmm. So these, so our ships could not enter. But the mines had been laid using local fishermen. So they sent me out with the local fishermen who had laid the mines to tell our mine laying forces. We had a mine layer, a mine sweeper waiting outside and my mission was to take this man to the mine sweeper have him pass on the information where they, they had to place the mines and so we went chug chug chugging through the minefield and he he and the interpreter went off and then when we returned what is it Maybe they're not going back aboard the Navy ship. I think they're going to send When we got to the naval ship, which was a minesweeper, a small ship, the, uh, the local fisherman and his interpreter went off, and they invited me to join them at meals. Mm -hmm. Well, meals for troops, like, it's opening a can of. No big deal. But here on this naval ship, you sat down at a table with a tablecloth, and there are people serving you. And I said, Am I in the same service with these guys? Any case, that defined. I was a, a ground, a ground hugger. They were in their own world. Well, let's see what else might be of interest to him. Well, he said he thought to himself, are they fighting the same war? <laughs> they were all neat and clean, and he was filthy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my, my episode in, uh, in South Vietnam raised questions about MacArthur. But, and his system, as I said, the troops in South Korea, our troops in South Korea had had taken all of South Korea except for the northernmost part which was attached to the continent. The Chinese communists who had taken over just the year before, they had taken over China in 1949, this was 1950. It was ambiguous what they are going to do about Korea. So, the, when, he, when MacArthur decreed that we would send troops, forces up and capture the capital of North Korea, to capture, to go in and capture the rest of Korea, which had an extensive hold, holding on the continent, that puts the, put the question of what the communists felt was theirs. And they had troops up in the hills of North Korea. As I said, there were electric generating plants that sent their power to Manchuria. MacArthur 
contested that by sending these forces into into that area and in, in, and endangering the communist hold on those mountains. Well, they soon made this position clear. We don't give a damn about Korea, but we do want these mountains who, which hold these electric generating plants. Now I wonder, how did MacArthur not know that this would happen? And then, through the research he did later, it became clear. He knew it, it would happen. He counted on its happening. And he then intended to go to war with China. And it, it had, the Chinese communists had captured China just a year before, captured them, and killed the regime, you might say, in its crib. The result was a standoff at the highest level between MacArthur and Truman, a little episode. They were to meet at an island in the Pacific. MacArthur had to fly in. <coughs> MacArthur got there first. And he should have landed and awaited Truman. He told his pilot, keep circling until Truman lands and he will greet me. That gave her. That led to MacArthur's being fired. Did you find this all out after when you were doing research on your own? <coughs> I couldn't understand it at first, but later on I did some research. The result is MacArthur was fired. But he had, MacArthur had been a little emperor. He had been in Japan. He was, he told the emperor of Japan what to do. And it went to his head. Of course, MacArthur had always been raised in an atmosphere of, you are the most brilliant man alive. When he went to West Point, his mother was there, <laughs> making sure that he would get the proper information. He came from a, a noted military family. So he had the ego to stand up to a president and lose. All right, thank you.